Hello, my name is Purse Jones. I'm the skipper of the schooner Skookum 3. We've just sailed in the America's Schooner Cup in San Diego, and uh, it was a wonderful blistery day, good schooner weather, a good time was had by all. A friend of mine and I had been sailing on his schooner, uh, Nighthawk, which is a William Hand 50-footer. We had been in Charleston, and we both lived in Jacksonville, Florida. And Hurricane Hugo was coming through, and we were debating about whether to go back to Jacksonville or weather it out in Charleston. The, the report was it was going to hit Jacksonville. We decided if you were going to be in trouble, it was better to be in trouble nearer to home, where you had friends and tools and pickup trucks. So we set south. We sailed into the St. Johns River as the Navy was sorting the fleet to send them to sea. Came up the river. By then it was clear that the hurricane was going to hit Charleston, not Jacksonville. So we were coming up the river, my friend said, I know where there's a really cool boat. Do you want to go look at it? I don't know why he even asked me. There's only one answer to that. Uh, we maneuvered to where Skookum uh, was tied up, and uh, it, was a, it was a weekend. There was no one in that particular marina, so we just kind of tied up alongside her and got up and started walking around. And I made a, a fatal mistake. I looked too hard and too long. A security guard came out, uh, a little upset with us, and said, what are you doing here? You're not supposed to be here. And I looked at him and said, well, I'm thinking about buying this boat. And he was suddenly my best friend. Uh, the, the school there where the boat was docked was trying to encourage the boat to leave. And he thought of me as an avenue to help the boat leave. Uh, the, the boat uh, is a uh, Sam Crocker design built by Britt Brothers in Lynn, Massachusetts. The original owner of Skookum had, uh, the reason she's named Skookum 3, that was her launching name, is the uh, owner had had three previous boats, all designed by Crocker and all built by Britt Brothers. Uh, Skookum had a, had a slightly different design concept than most of the schooners of the day in the sense that the owner had a sandbar he needed to get over to where he wanted to dock her. So she was purpose designed and built to have a draft of about six feet seven inches. Whereas a typical schooner of her size would have a draft perhaps of nine feet. Because of that difference, she's about a foot wider in beam, uh, and her keel is cast of lead instead of iron. Uh, the original owner, uh, it's reported, I don't know if this is just rumor, but it's reported, and when he died, his will directed the boat be sold and the proceeds be used to deliver the mail and the paper every Sunday to the Boston Lightship. At one point, Skookum was donated to the Mystic Museum uh, to, for them to raise money. They already had a wonderful Sparkman Stevens schooner named Brilliant. They didn't really need another one, so ultimately they sold her. 
uh, to the man who owned Ideal Windless Company. This would have been about 1959. And uh, that's the point at which she was converted from uh, gaff foresail to main staysail. She's always had a Marconi main. And they did that in preparation to entering her in the 1960 Bermuda race. That race was famous because a hurricane blew right through the middle of it. The editor of Yachting Magazine, Bill Robinson, was aboard Barlovento, the DuPont family boat names, big steel catch. And he reports Skookum came sailing up from astern, creeping, creeping, slowly gaining. And they're wondering, what bustle is that? What's her handicap? Is she in our class? And she creeps up and creeps up, uh, comes right alongside, and Bill Robinson has his camera out. There's a wonderful series of pictures in his book of Skookum pulling up. Skookum has given it all she has, and Barlovento slowly pulls away. She went through several owners and came to be owned by a group of oil patch boys from Houston area. And they chartered her out of uh, the U.S. Virgin Islands for a period of time. And uh, during that uh, interval of ownership, she participated in the uh, 200th celebration of America's founding in the 1976 Tall Ships event in New York Harbor. So I have a, a bronze plaque about uh, nine inches by nine inches still on board the boat, as well as a larger certificate, which is uh, interesting to me. It's signed by uh, a fellow named Senator Warner, who's probably better known for being Elizabeth Taylor's husband than he is for being Secretary of Commerce and a senator. Well, uh, the security guard uh, allowed, uh, unlocked the warehouse so I could go in and look at the masts and other things, and I started to get a little more interested. Uh, the interior of the boat was just a cave. It had been completely stripped. There was nothing there. The masts were out up in the warehouse. Uh, and I made him another mistake. I asked him, did he have the phone number of the owner? The owner was a relatively young man and he had done carpentry work on the boat and instead of paying him, the owners gave him the boat. That's a major sign of trouble ahead. Uh, he struggled, he didn't have financial resources. Uh, at one point he approached the Coast Guard about just taking her out to sea and sinking her. They told him no, he couldn't do that. When, he call when I called him, he thought of me as maybe someone who would try to help the boat survive. I assured him I would uh, do my best, and I had some limited resources, uh, some more ability to deal with the issues than he had, uh, and I also had a backup plan. The keel in the boat was lead, I figure about 25,000 pounds. Lead was 40 cents a pound. If we hauled her out, and she broke in half in the lift. Uh, it was time for chainsaws and uh, lead going to the, to the metal salvagers. Uh, we hauled her out, she didn't break up, and the rest, as they say, is history. If you have a boat, one of the, one of the first issues you have to address is where am I gonna park it? What am, where am I gonna do with it? My financial status was such that I could either pay to keep the boat in a marina or I could pay to do the rebuilding, but not both. I was fortunate in that my home was on the water on the St. John's River. So all I needed was a dock. There had been a dock there in the past, but when Hurricane Dora hit Jacksonville many years before it took out the dock, so all that were left was, were some worm-eaten pilings coming up like pencil points. Uh, I called uh, the various permitting authorities. They told me, absolutely, you can't build a new dock. They're forbidden. I said, well, how about rebuilding an old dock? Oh, you can do that. Do I need a permit for that? No. Uh, 
I looked at this from the very beginning. Uh, my first thought is this is such a beautiful thing, this boat. Somebody has to do something or she's going to disappear forever. And I looked around and the only somebody I could see was me. Uh, but I had limited resources. I, I had a place I could put her, but I didn't have tons of money. So I had to think carefully about how am I going to approach this? What's my plan? Uh, one of the classic mistakes people who want to rebuild a boat make is the first thing they do is tear everything apart. Uh, and then they start with planning what they're going to do next. And that's usually about when they run out of money and ambition. And you have to be very careful about that. You have to pace your financial resources, your people resources, and your material resources into tranches of work uh, that you can afford and accommodate and, and realistically perform. So my philosophy from the beginning was I wanted to use high quality materials. So for instance, all the plywood is marine grade plywood. And we used real epoxy resin and real epoxy glue. Uh, all bronze, nearly all bronze uh, fastenings holding the planking to the frames. And there must be, uh, I call them gold bolts made out of silicone bronze, 3 8 diameter. The bolt, the shelf to the ribs and uh, or the, the shelf to the deck beams and the ribs to the shelf. Uh, there are a lot of them in there and a lot of them had to be threaded an inch or so longer this way, manually, by hand. Another consideration was I knew I couldn't afford and didn't particularly want mm. to hire a crew of professional boat builders to do the work. I had the idea that I needed a supervisor or a foreman in the marine industry, we'd call that person a shipwright, to be in charge because I didn't have the skills or the knowledge. Uh, even my shipwright was a relatively young man. He made his reputation on this rebuild job. From then on, if someone said to him, what makes you think you're capable of doing my job? He said, look at these pictures. Also, we tried to use locally sourced materials where we could. Uh, white oak was, is also uh, plentiful and reasonably inexpensive, but I made it even more inexpensive. After northeasters would blow through the neighborhood, uh, if the soil was soaked with water, the root balls on the bottom of the oak trees uh, were relatively small in diameter. The trees would blow over. I would drive around the neighborhood, go up and knock on people's doors and say, hey, I see you have a, have a tree down in your yard. Uh, what are you doing about it? And usually I'd get an answer like, oh, I'm getting bids. The lowest one I have so far is um, $1,000 to remove it. Uh, at the time, I owned a flatbed trailer big enough for a car to drive up on. And I would say, well, um, I'll do it for free. Or maybe I'd say, for only $400, I'll do it. And I had a big chainsaw. I had a, probably a 40-inch bar on it. And I'd call a few of my friends. So we would take all of the pieces we thought we could use, some of the smaller limbs uh, we would cut up and sell for firewood to fund our effort. And the rest got loaded on the flatbed trailer. I had an arrangement with a local sawmill. This is a guy who has a saw blade about five inches wide, big circle saw, teeth about an inch wide. And he was free to use my logs to support whatever customers he had, as long as when I came with an order, he had logs to support me. And that worked out very well. Uh, but in general, my idea was I wanted, to, I wanted to keep the costs under control because I didn't want the project to get halfway or two-thirds finished and fail. And I always had the idea of I was trying to learn about wooden boats and particularly about schooners. I had, I had no experience uh, on any schooner except my buddy's uh, uh, William Hand schooner. 
And I had absolutely no experience uh, even being a crew, much less a captain, on a boat uh, as big as Skookum. She's uh, 64 feet on deck. I, have, I had never handled anything like that, and I remember having a conversation with myself. I was a little worried about that. And I thought about it, and I thought about it, and I thought, well, when you get her back in the water, then what are you going to do? And I made one resolve that I have always respected, and that is, no matter what, I am not going to be afraid of this boat. And that has stood me in good stead. Now, that doesn't mean I'm reckless or careless, but no matter what, I'm not going to be afraid. And the other resolve I had was, I am going to see this through to the end. Before I bought the boat, uh, she had sunk at the dock in Virgin Gorda. Uh, maybe, I think it was 1907, 1982, I think, she sunk at the dock in Virgin Gorda. And uh, they hauled her out and did major work. But instead of repairing the ribs and frames on the inside of the boat, what they did instead was they uh, removed all of the traditional cotton caulking and putty that would be uh, what you put in between the planks to keep the water out and also it helps, helps keep the plank from moving like this against each other. And uh, they uh, uh, took uh, a router or a circle saw and uh, machined the distance between the planks the, where, where the caulking had been to a uniform dimension. They made some mahogany splines that were perhaps a quarter of an inch wide and an inch and a quarter deep and say 10 feet long. They took rain gutters and put caps on the end, filled them with epoxy, dipped the splines in the epoxy, lifted them up to the seams and drove them in with mallets. So essentially what they had done was they had turned what had been one strip of planking, one strip of planking, one strip of planking. And through this method of splining and gluing, they connected them all together. Essentially, they turned the hull into something very much like a sheet of plywood. And in addition, they fixed whatever problems there had been in the planking. On the outside, they fared it out and put on a very thin layer, maybe a sixteenth of an inch thick of polypropylene cloth set in epoxy resin. And that functioned uh, not so much as an improvement to the strength as a, sort of a super duty kind of paint job. So when I was working on her, the planking was in pretty good shape, plus it had been glued together into this plywood sort of idea. Uh, I, I shored her up on the outside was fearful that the boat might try to change shape without the ribs in her. And uh, away we went. Uh, it turned out uh, that spline job is probably what saved the boat in that area. That also allowed me to focus almost entirely on the ribs inside the boat uh, as opposed to having to deal also with the planking. In many res restorations they'll take out every other plank take out every other rib, uh, put in new ribs where they took out, and then remove the, the remaining parts. That's a tremendously labor-intensive effort. The first steps of our restoration were essentially in the interior of the boat. As I described, when I bought her, it was just a cave. There was nothing in there at all. It was like a, like a dark cave. And it was quite obvious that uh, she needed all new ribs or frames is a different word for ribs. I may use those interchangeably. And the ribs uh, gets, uh, come down the sides of the boat and the planking gets screwed into the ribs. And then there's a cross uh, member at the bottom called a floor or a floor timber. Uh, and the floor timbers uh, typically have a large bolt, mine or inch and a quarter keel bolt, that goes through the floor timber, through the large timbers in the bottom of the boat, and through the keel, and that's what holds the keel to the boat, transfers the load. Uh, 
uh, through the floor timber and up into the ribs or frames and from there into the planking and up above there's a structure that's a, kind of a right angle uh, called a shelf and a clamp and that ties the ribs into the deck beam, deck beams and uh, uh, into each other. So what we were doing is taking out all of the old ribs. Well, nearly all of them. The, the ones above the waterline and the bow uh, were still in good condition. And the ones uh, behind the cockpit were in good condition. So I, I, I didn't do much with them. But the cockpit floor was out. Uh, and this was the ideal time to replace all of those frames. Otherwise, there's only about this much room to crawl around in there, and it's virtually impossible to work on them. So we, we started back there with the ribs. The ribs were made out of uh, oak uh, finches, we would call them, and that means when we ran the, the, the log through the sawmill, uh, the sawmill had a five-foot blade, the log was maybe 18 inches or two feet uh, in, di in diameter. And when we ran the, the log through the sawmill, it just made planks of wood. Uh, so both sides of it were parallel and cut by the saw, uh, but the edges were just where the bark was on the tree. So we took them that way. And then they had to be sawn into the shape of the hull. So we had, we had to have a way of taking off uh, the shape and uh, largely we used what's called a tick stick, just a piece of wood with holes drilled in it and rods going this way. And we would tap them out till they hit the edge of the hull and then lay that on the plank and mark it and then take a batten and hold it so it was a smooth curve and we'd make a mark. Uh, but most of them also, also have to be tapered because as the boat, as the as you move forward in the boat, the sides go from being roughly parallel to being more like this, more like this, more like this. And to accommodate that, inside the boat we set up a 20-inch bandsaw. The first haul out, we did the forward third of the boats, meaning back through the forward mast step, and then coming from the aft end of the boat toward the center. Uh, we did everything under the cockpit floor, uh, under the bridge deck, uh, up through uh, where the engine beds were. Those are big, uh, big uh, square timbers about six feet long to which the engine is bolted down. But it did yeoman's work. It would sing as it cut that oak. The masts are a very interesting story. I first saw them in the warehouse uh, when the security guard, my new best friend, let me in. Uh, the main mast was 72 feet long. The foremast, as I recall, was about 55 feet long. And the main mast had, uh, was pretty weak in a couple of sections where it was badly rotted. I was looking at that thinking, how are you going to get that from the warehouse to where we were going to work, at, work on it? Where we were going to work on it was my house. And uh, I thought and I thought and I worried about it and I called a couple of uh, trucking companies and I asked, how much would you charge me to move a 72-foot mast? And they started laughing. Uh, just from the beginning point, uh, uh, that's way too long to be maximum legal lengths. So the first thing you'd have to do is get special permits, close off the highway. A couple of my friends and I started working on with using backyard engineering, how are we going to move those masts. I looked at it and said, well maybe I can find some way to hook the butt end to the trailer hitch on my pickup truck. And the other end, I had a trailer from my 11-foot Boston whaler. I turned it uh, backwards to the way you would expect to see it. I, I was trying to be able to turn this thing. If you get the, the back dolly wheels too close to the front, then the rear end sweeps every time you make a turn. And if you get it too far aft, the thing is likely to break in the middle. And we came back early on a Sunday morning. It was summertime, so it was getting light pretty early, maybe 5, 5.30 in the morning. 
and we had reconnoitered the route. There was one place where we had to make a hard left turn to get up on the Interstate 10. I had to go about 20 miles. And as we made the turn, the back end of the mass swung around and swept across about a lane and a half of traffic. And I'm looking in my rear view mirrors constantly, I see a Florida Highway Patrol and he's slowly pulling up next to me and I'm thinking, well, any minute now, he's gonna turn on the blue lights and this adventure is gonna be over. I finally can't ignore him anymore, so I look over at him and the patrolman looks at me, he looks directly at me and he does this. No! And he just drove away. Uh, later, later the masts were the, uh, the target of considerable work, uh, starting with uh, ordering balks of timber four inches thick, 12 inches wide, 16 feet long, shipped from Seattle. Uh, this is uh, what, what used to be called, maybe still is, aircraft grade spruce. That means no knots anywhere and all very straight grain. Uh, then we had to cove them out on the inside because the masts are hollow and we had to build uh, scarf joints. Uh, but we did major, major, major work on those masts. And again, with the same kind of crew, one skilled uh, shipwright and three or four uh, relatively unskilled, all relatively young. In those days, even I was young. Later, we had a lot of fun. I, I assembled about uh, 20 close friends and we picked the masts up, marched out the dock uh, with the masts one at a time, stepped over onto the boat and set the masts down on sawhorses so we could go to where the crane was to get them stepped. It was quite an adventure and a lot of fun. <laughs> the company I worked for at the time wanted me to move to California, and I didn't really want to. Uh, but I liked my life in Florida. My home was on the water, my boat was right there, my workshop was right there. And I knew all of these marine trade people, they were my friends. Uh, they finally piled the money high enough uh, so that I couldn't say no. I was too embarrassed to say no. Uh, they, I had complained, well, if I come to California, I have to bring my boat. It costs a lot to ship a boat. And they, I, they said, we'll pay to ship the boat. And I said, do you know how much that costs? And the answer was, we don't care. Uh, so we did the, the final tranche of the work, some more work in the middle of the boat. Uh, we hauled out in St. Augustine. And that's when we did the keel bolts. Uh, the longest keel bolt was 44 inches, they're an inch and a quarter uh, bronze, and we drove the old ones out and the new ones in with an eight pound sledgehammer from inside the boat. And I had a man underneath who would cut it with a sawzall so we could do it in two increments so we didn't have to dig too deep. We finished up uh, all of what I would call the structural repairs. So by now she's strong, uh, we've, we've used, I say we drove a bazillion bronze screws and bungs and there's a, there's a lot of effort that goes into this. They came to pick up the boat, a big uh, flatbed trailer. The truck driver was quite proud. The rails on the trailer were two inches above the ground. So the whole rig was set up to be low to the road. Uh, the, partly the reason for that is I called this the two trip. The boat was too wide, it was too tall, it was too long, it was too heavy, and ultimately it had to come on two trucks because it was too heavy. They had to take everything that could be segregated from the boat and put it on a second truck. I probably hadn't sailed the boat six times by the time we left to come to, to California. When I came to San Diego, uh, I wasn't here two days till a fellow named Paul Plotz was knocking on my hull, and I call Paul my, my hero in schoonering. Uh, he helped me with everything. Uh, 
sales, uh, crew, uh, advice. Uh, I recall he was encouraging me to enter a schooner race. I bet I hadn't sailed the boat six times. And here he is wanting me to race it. Uh, the only crew I had were a few pick-me-ups from the marina that I was in. And they didn't know anything about schooners. Uh, we knew a fisherman was the name of a sail. We had never had one up. And Paul kept telling me, you should enter the race, you should enter the race. And I would, I would have one reason after another why that wasn't a good idea. Well, I don't have crew. I'll send you crew. And he did. He sent me uh, Bobby Edwards and several others uh, who were highly skilled, uh, good trainers for the young guys I had coming up in my crew. Uh, and eventually I uh, got down to, uh, okay, you've been out sailing, you, you know what a fisherman is now, and you've had one up, so you're going to enter the race, right? I said, well, I'm afraid, Paul, that uh, I've never been in a sailboat race as a crew or anything else. Uh, I just don't know what to do. He said, oh, it's easy, just follow me. And then I said, well, I'm afraid I might hit you. He said, I won't let you. At which point I said, I can't think of a single other objective will be there for the race. Uh, we, had, we had been second, we had uh, we'd been places further down, but uh, in 2014, it finally all came together. And th there are a lot of things that have to come together. It has to be the right wind speed for your boat. The crew has to perform uh, at a high level. Uh, it doesn't hurt if your main competitor is absent that day. I don't really have a lot of memory about the events of the race. Our first Schooner Cup was in 99, we won in 14, uh, that's about 15 years we chased the chalice uh, before we finally won. What I mainly uh, remember was after it was all over and I had the, the little trophy and the promise of getting our boat name on the big trophy, uh, I mainly remember looking at the crew and having them look at me and thinking, it's been a long trail, but it's been worth every step. Uh, the friends we made, the associations we had with each other, uh, the lessons we learned, not just about how to sail a schooner, but about life, uh, about people, uh, about uh, dealing with adverse circumstances. When I first saw her, I was struck with the beauty, the physical beauty of the boat and the power of it. Uh, and that was the initial hook. Uh, thereafter, for a period of time through today, I would say there's a large responsibility associated with it. Uh, and I'm now coming to have uh, uh, the idea that at some point, I'm going to run out of physical ability or ambition or money, and someone else is going to have to own the boat. And that's a very hard idea for me. But it's going to come. It's difficult for me to say you should love a physical object but I think that's pretty close to what it is.